the Nashville Network, America's country home. Diamond B Sports presents the American Sports Cavalcade. A panorama of speed, color, drama, and excitement. The American Sports Cavalcade. This is Gainesville Raceway in Gainesville, Florida, home of the NH Rate Motorcraft Gator Nationals and side of some of the great moments in top fuel dragster racing. This is Joe Amato in 1984. Not only did he win the Gator Nationals Championship in top fuel, but had a great moment in his career along the way. This was a semifinal race against Gary Ormsby. At that time, in 1984, many men had knocked on 260 miles an hour, but nobody had broken through that barrier. On a beautiful afternoon in Florida, it was Ormsby up in smoke, and Amato slashing through the timing lights at 260 miles an hour, the first man ever to do so. It was a momentum he created there that carried him on to victory in the Gator Nationals and the World Championship. In 1985, it was veteran Dick LaHaye's turn to take the Gator Nationals Championship. This was the final round where LaHaye faced off with Joe Amato, Joe's second consecutive final round berth. Could an unpainted, unsponsored car driven by a 45-year-old man from Michigan beat the highly touted world champion? Could he do it? Yes, he could. Dick LaHaye wins the 85 Gators and has only helped his daughter Kim, the crew chief on that automobile. For Dick LaHaye, it was his biggest ever drag racing payday and a triumph he'll never forget. And now, this year, the greatest name in the sport, Don Garlitz, from just down the road in Ocala, comes to the Gator Nationals with a revolutionary automobile. An automobile with audacious streamlining that may very well be the harbinger of a whole new breakthrough in top fuel. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans. Since the very beginning of Top Fuel Dragster Racing, the emphasis has always been right here, on the motor. Bigger and bigger engines, larger superchargers, more complex and refined fuel systems to ram even more of that nitromethane in. Bottom line, power. Well, as that power becomes increasingly difficult to find, some drivers are exploring new ground. This is Don Garlitz, Swamp Rat 30, debuting here at Gainesville this weekend. Now, Don has added this very sleek Lexan canopy to the car to hopefully cheat the wind. Rat under glass, if you will. But the big news, as far as aerodynamics are concerned, is possibly up here at the front of the car. Now, this is the most unusual front-end configuration that we have ever seen. Certainly the narrowest track, and also tiny, tiny front wheels, only 13 inches. Everybody else's are about 22, especially built front wheels that don't even have tires on them, just kind of a, an industrial-style V-belt. Now, this whole front body piece is carbon fiber and only weighs four pounds. And Don says that its shape will punch a hole in the wind that he's going to drive right through, not just to 270, but 280 miles per hour. Now, Don didn't read any books or consult any engineers or wind tunnels. This is common sense and swamp science. Well, another driver took a different approach. Brock Yates is with that car. Well, Steve, as you well know, guys have been trying streamlining almost from the origins of the sport of drag racing. It hadn't worked too well. In fact, your pal Don Garlitz used it in 1972 and scared himself a lot simply because the cars tended to fly. Well, over the years, we've learned a great deal about aerodynamics in race cars, especially in Formula One and Indianapolis-type racing. And that is exactly where Gary Ormsby went when he designed this beautiful new body for his top fuel dragster that he brought to the Winter Nationals in Pomona. Now, you'll remember that they had some problems there. A body flex at Pomona in qualifying caused the magneto to uh, break up, and they had a giant blower fire. But since then, it's been cured. The race car now is back here and in full trim with a full Kevlar body. In fact, it's such an Indianapolis-type car that this windshield actually comes from a March Indy car the actual windshield but the important part about the body is this lip down here that causes a whole lot of downforce to work on the edges of the automobile it has a full belly pan has wings up front all sorts of sophisticated aerodynamics but i think the important part about the, this particular race car is that gary tells me that it's only the beginning he has yet another brand new automobile ready to go with an even more sophisticated aerodynamic setup so you've just started to see 
the really super streamliners come into top fuel. In round one of top fuel racing earlier today, it was that very streamliner of Gary Ormsby in the far lane. In the near lane, the 30-year drag racing veteran Connie Coletta from Ypsilanti, Michigan. 3,000 horsepower engines apiece. Coletta won two races last year, operates a very successful flying service out of his home base in Ypsilanti. Gary Ormsby is a car dealer in Roseville, California, and a longtime drag racing veteran as well, with a couple of national event victories to his credit. Even Coletta fans were watching Gary Ormsby, the bizarre looking machine in the far lane, but Ormsby was down on power. It just kind of weaved its way down the course, and Connie Coletta went on to round number two at 5.50 seconds. Ormsby will have to wait till another day for that 270 mile an hour run. Well, Gary, you didn't win it, but uh, I guess that's a price you pay for being a pioneer in a lot of ways. I, I, I suppose that you have to be pleased in a sense that uh, she ran as well as she did. Well, I got down the track, Brock, and <laughs> that's been a little more than we did at Pomona, you know, and we've been working with it. This is actually the first race we've had to work with it, and it's, uh, so we're a little disappointed we're out the first round, but... Sure. We are, too, but uh, we know that uh, it's the shape of things to come, and uh, we'll count on seeing you at the next show with a more successful uh, round, I'm sure. Well, thank you, Brock. Okay. We are sorry we're sorry you Well, Brock, I've heard you say what looks right is right, and that car just looks bad. Its day will come. Here also in first round was the unique little short car of Diamond Dave Miller from Atasca, Illinois. About four feet shorter in wheelbase than any other car, but we saw last year it can fly, but he was up against Big Daddy. Don Garlitz, four-time winner here at the Gator Nationals, but his last win goes way back to 1978. I don't have to tell you, this partisan Florida crowd was pulling for Big Daddy. A couple of unique vehicles, but all eyes were on the Garlitz car. Blasting off the line, looking as if it was running without front tires. He won easily 544, 264 miles an hour. But it was a victory that came not without major penalties. Steve had a look. Well, in qualifying last week, and Don Garlitz had some problems with the front tires, if you can even call it a tire, and it appears that there's a problem again, as uh, the rubber that he had applied over that V-belt has apparently come apart and done some damage to the front end. It'll be interesting to see uh, if they can repair this and run in the second round. This could be a problem that could conceivably put him out of the race. We'll follow this story. More top fuel action. The first lady of drag racing, Shirley Muldown. He's still on the comeback trail from her 1984 crash. Backs into the line against her first round duel against the former professional football star, Dan Pastorini. This is no playboy effort by Dan Pastorini. Takes his drag racing very seriously. Watch this, in qualified. Pastorini in the near lane cup, boom blower explosion actually took a cylinder head off of the motor pastorini did a tremendous job of keeping the car under control but a lot of people said he won't be back this is a bucks down unsponsored effort somewhere pastorini found the parts to put the car back together and found himself racing surely in round one another look at a horrific blower explosion one of the worst ever Shirley Muldowney, what can you say? The only three-time top fuel world champion, a movie of her life a few years ago. She's back after that terrible accident. And in the far lane, in qualifying, she, too, let one go. Supercharger explosion. Not nearly as spectacular as Pastorini's, but still very, very expensive. And that's her third floor explosion in three races. Now, remember, this was earlier action. Shirley in the far lane, Dan Pastorini in the near lane. Pastorini is yet to achieve his first victory in NHRA championship competition. He's qualified for every race he's attended, but he's yet to get a win light. Pastorini in the near lane. The beautiful black car. As I said before, very few parts and pieces available in their trailer. Donnie Couch wrenches his car and pulled up a miracle to get it back. It was Pastorini off the mark first. Pastorini. Pole shot at Shirley Mulaney. Few have done that. The electronic finish line judge calls it for Dan Pastorini. Beautiful drive for Pasarini, his first victory, 5.73. A slower ET, but the victory was his. And a surprising moment at the end of the racetrack. You'd have thought both drivers won. Pasarini so delighted with his effort, and Shirley Muldowney seemed generally happy for him. The two of them shared some great conversation at the other end. Shirley admitting she was late and congratulating Dan. Well, you can be sure these two will meet again in years to come. The lady on the comeback trail and Pastorini on the verge of a whole new career in top fuel. 
And Brock, as always, not an empty seat in the house here for the Gator Nationals. An awful lot of interest in this race, especially surrounding the new Don Garland Streamliner. Good news, Big Daddy has some more of those strange V-belts for the front wheels. His friends and neighbors are pitching into fiberglass up the nose beat. He'll be back. American Sports Cavalcade, brought to you by AC Delco, the smart part. Test pilot Chuck Yeager for AC Delco. A pure power when you need it can save your neck. When you get back down to your car, it helps too. Today's smaller engines need extra firepower from a spark plug, and AC delivers. If you could look inside your engine, you'd see an AC spark plug delivering up to 30,000 volts, firing 30 times a second. Firepower when you need it from AC. Get rebates now on AC spark plugs. Never wait for trouble. Energizer Halogen, a light so bright, so white, no ordinary light can match it. The Energizer Halogen Flashlight, up to 300% more light than ordinary flashlights. And it's Energizer Rugged, even waterproof. The Energizer Halogen Flashlight, so bright, so incredibly bright, it outshines ordinary flashlights, up to 300% brighter from Energizer. You're going to see a tire through the eyes of some of the country's best high-performance drivers. On the track and on the street. It's the tight-tracking, road-gripping General XP 2000H. Bred for racing, but born to run hard and sure on any road. If you've got a lot of car, you need a lot of tire. You need the General XP 2000H at your General Tire dealer now. For all the right reasons, you need you won't believe what's happening inside your muffler. Rust that starts on the inside is eating its way through. The Napa Advantage muffler with Absorbite helps prevent internal rust. The inside of this muffler was not protected with Absorbite. This muffler was. You can see the difference. The Napa Advantage is even covered by a lifetime warranty. Of course, you may never have to use it. The Napa Advantage, it puts rust at a disadvantage. Available at thousands of Napa outlets. Well, the repair work on Don Darlett's new Streamliner continues here at the Gator Nationals, and you can see that it's a little bit of a hurry-up job. Kind of a finishing touch there with a can of black spray paint. Uh, not exactly what you'd find at the uh, your Rod and Custom Show, Steve. <laughs> no, not hardly. Here is Dan Pastorini. You'll recall in first round, he defeated Shirley Muldowney. Well, it's time for round two, but Dan is going to get a gift. He will have a solo run. He will advance to the semifinals with no problem whatsoever. The man he was scheduled to race here in round two, the colorful Greek from Chicago, Illinois, Chris Karamasinis, defeated Bill Mullins in round number one, but destroyed so many parts that the Greek just had to put the old car in the box and take a seat in the grandstands. He just couldn't come back. You know, Dan Pastorini is probably a little tired of being referred to as an ex-NFL quarterback. Drag racing is something he always wanted to do and is now finally getting the chance. I talked to him earlier. Anything that a decade in pro football uh, uh, helped you with getting a, your feet wet in this sport? Well, I think it's just, you know, the willingness to work. Uh, you have to work in football just like you have to do in this business. And right now it's just Donnie and myself. And uh, we work very well together. It's, I'm fortunate that I've got good people working with me and, and helping me out. This industry is, uh, is a tremendous industry. The NHRA has helped us a bunch. Uh, all of our sponsors that are on the car have helped us trem tremendously, and, and I'm very appreciative of that fact. Which is harder work, football or drag racing? Drag racing. Which is more fun? Drag racing. <laughs> two for two. That's right. All right, Pastorini has an interesting decision to make here. Does he go for it, try to set a low ET, and then get lane choice in the next round? Or is it, does he just make a very gentle pass simply to get into the next round? What do you think, Steve? I think he makes a gentle pass, Brock. I looked at his trailer. There are very few spare parts. Pastorini can't afford to break a thing. He abandons this run. He'll coast on through into the semis and give up any chance of lane choice. He had to do that. In fact, I'm proud of him for doing that. Uh, a little ego could have pushed the guy to the finish line. It wouldn't have been a smart move. Interesting that uh, he runs 729, which is still a pro stock mark that uh, would be very difficult to beat, and uh, he shot off about quarter track. These things are rockets. 
Okay, we've got a couple of familiar names coming up. Now it's Connie Coletta against Gary Beck. But before that, let's go to Steve and Pastorini. Well, Dan, that's kind of like the other team not showing up. <laughs> Those are few and far between, but we'll welcome it right now, Steve. An intelligent move you made up there. Running that left-hand lane, there's been some doubts about that lane. Now, you don't have lane choice, so you know someone's going to probably put you there. Well, we knew that we wouldn't have lane choice, choice naturally. We just wanted to go out and see if the card shake, and it didn't shake. It left very hard and set up real good, so... We figure Gartlitz or whoever's ever winning the next round will probably have the right lane. That's been the better lane today, so we were preparing for the left lane. And looking in your trailer, I can see why you didn't want to risk running for lane choice. <laughs> we're short on a few bucks. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in the semifinals. Okay, thank you. So, Pastorini heads back to the pits to begin work for his next shot, and here is Connie Coletta backing in. His opponent, once again, will be the two-time world champion, Gary Beck, who still holds the low ET mark in all of drag racing at a 539. A man who's had a little bit of a hard time last season, but is one of the most formidable opponents ever in this sport. Well, he salvaged 1985 with a win at the NHRA World Finals in Pomona, California, the last race of the season. Connie Coletta, boy, he had a good year in 85. He won, uh, what, the Mile High Nationals in Denver, the North Star Nationals in Brainerd, Minnesota, uh, he's running uh, as well as he ever has compared to the competition. And seems to be having a lot of fun doing it. You don't see the kind of pressure on Connie uh, that he seemed to have in his earlier career. Just out there having a good time. This is Connie Coletta's golf course. I mean, he's a hard-working man. This is his pleasure. Gary back in the far lane. It is back away first. Gary back with a good advantage off the starting line. Here comes Coletta. It is Gary back. Connie Coletta runs quicker, but Gary Beck wins it. Yes, a 560 to a 563 for Gary Beck. Top speed about the same, 255 to 257, but it was right here on the line. Beck squeezed a perfect light and literally blew Connie away on the start. Connie made a race of it at mid-track, but it was that beautiful start that brought Gary the victory. Gary Beck, nice driving. Uh, you beat Connie Coletta with a hole shot. Oh, Trivia, we needed it. I know he was, he's been running real good, and our car's a little inconsistent, so we have to go for it. <laughs> you ran very well in the left lane, which some said was maybe subpar. Well, yes and no, but it's, you know, it was all right. I didn't hear the ET yet, but it's, it's uh, you know, we're, it held on good. 563. Well, it's a little slower than last time, but it was all right. Gary Beck goes into the semis. Well, no driver likes to be beat off the line. Brock is with Connie Coletta. Well, Connie Coletta checking over the engine here. It uh, looks like that didn't break, but a uh, 560, Connie, I think he had you. Yeah, he run, he run, he run three tenths uh, slower than I did, and, and uh, sometimes we got a clutch problem in that we had to put two new discs back in it again, and the car just isn't reacting. You step on it, and it's it's not moving like it's supposed to. So that was the that was the reason for the late start. Yeah, we put two new discs in the thing, and it just it didn't pull. The thing didn't ET decent. It, you know, we run 550 last round, and it caught some clutch discs and we put some more weight in a new disc and it's the wrong way to go. Wrong way, Ron. Well, we're sorry, yeah. Okay. Me too. <laughs> well, Brock Connie's work day is not over. His son, Scott, has a funny car we'll be seeing later on and I'm sure Connie will be wrenching on it. And speaking of wrenching, those are the hands of the master. Don Garlic sliding the pistons into that aluminum racing Hemi for round two action to come. Stay with us here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. Gainesville, Florida, and I'll tell you what, the stands are packed right now because we've got a big one coming up. It's Big Daddy Don Garlitz, who's going to go against the current top speed record holder in top fuel, Steve Evans, and that, of course, is Pennsylvania's Joe Amato. That's right. Just a month or so ago in California, Amato ran 269 miles an hour, and it's a real duel between these two as to who will be first to go 270. You're looking in the far lane at the 84 World Champion, in the near lane at the 85 World Champion, it has the potential of being the best race of the day. Well, remember, Steve, a couple of years ago, it was a motto with that new high-wing car that ran 260 here. That's right. He stole all the thunder. But this year, it's Big Daddy. And you'd be smiling, too, if you brought a brand-new, untried car to one of the biggest events on the circuit and qualified number one. And Joe comes here with perhaps a little vengeance in his heart. Let's not forget that he gave up his world championship to Garlitz last year. That's right. He didn't like scraping that gold leaf number one off the wing at all. And this is a lady that had to take it off, and she liked it even less, his wife, Cherry. 
Well, it's hard to describe a Matos car as old, but it really, in a sense, that it's an old design against the uh, brand new, very radical machine of uh, Carlitz, I guess you could call it, a little, at least conventional, Steve. And let me tell you what's going to happen very quickly. You're going to see canopies like that on virtually every car. Carlitz says you can't believe what it's like not having that wind blast in your face. It's quieter. He said it's just like going up for a drive in the family car. <laughs> and I understand the people that make them already have 20 some odd orders, maybe one from Amato. They're pre staged. That's Amato in the far lane. And the strange front end with a little bit of wheels. A big daddy in the near lane. Will those V belts stay on this time? Scarlett is away first. Scarlett's with a monster hole shot. Amato says goodbye, big daddy. It is Garlitz winning it at 546. Now he's slowed to 246 miles an hour. He doesn't want to run any faster than he has to, Brock. And again, the belts came off. Yes, they did. As we watch it again, there's the hole shot that carried Garlitz to victory. The car looking almost like a blunt-nosed spear driving down the racetrack and easily beating the former world champion, Joe Amato. But the victory has not been without its penalties. Once again, the front tires have come off those unique small wheels. And Garlitz has gotten out of the automobile, immediately went up front to have a look at the damage. He is concerned. Steve is with him. Well, for Don Garlitz, a very fine 546 puts him in the semifinal round. And I'm just hoping uh, that he's got plenty of those belts for the front wheels. From what we've seen so far today, he's going to possibly need some more. Don, do you have plenty of those? I got plenty of them. What was that you were ripping out of the front bodywork? It was a little spacer that goes in there. So Garlitz obviously very, very concerned. Uh, now more with the motor than he is the front end. As we've said before, he knows that these uh, tire arrangements, if you can call them tires, is just a temporary measure until he finds the right thing. But as you can see, the front end of this car again chewed up. The fiberglass and resin will be back out in Big Daddy's pits. Well, you seldom see Garlitz more concerned after a victory like that. A very satisfying one, by the way. So he definitely has problems. We'll stay up with him. But now, it's back to the starting line where the reigning champion here at the Gator National, Dick LaHaye, is ready to go against the youngster from just down the road in Miami, Florida, Darrell Gwynn. And the Florida fans are plenty proud of Darrell Gwynn. He won the opening race of the season, the Winter Nationals in Pomona, California, a little over a month ago. And what a boost that was for this family-supported race car. Well, you could call both these guys the bedrock of the sport. Dick LaHaye, a full-time professional, not quite as well-financed a team as some others, in the same way with Darrell Gwynn, as you said. Both guys work very hard, struggle hard with family members to stay in there. Unfortunately, Darrell Gwynn had a big setback in qualifying as well with a major blower fire, Steve. Indeed, Brock. Gwynn came to the Gators full of confidence, but it evaporated right here. At the Winter Nationals, he ran five consecutive 540 elapsed times and never heard a part. Not so here. I talked to a very down young man. Well, Darrell, a plenty spectacular fire from where we sat. Did you know uh, that you had all that flame trail on you? No, I didn't. Um, I really didn't expect to have what happened happen, but uh, those kind of things happen. Um, we don't hurt a lot of parts in this car, so I, I don't know a lot of times when to lift when the piston's hurting because we don't hurt it that many yeah. times, so I don't have real good experience at lifting. It didn't burn too early, but... Um, Anyways, I figured the car would run 540. I'm very unhappy with a 558. It should have run 535 and blew the rods out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that young man now with a new motor on board and some of those precious spare parts and precious dollars expended to get him here against Dick LaHaye. And also, Gwen has a new respect for what can happen. He knows what it feels like now when the motor goes away. Dick LaHaye in the near line. He's blown up plenty of motors. He'll blow up some more if that's what it takes to win. It is LaHaye away. It is LaHaye by a couple of car lanes. And daughter Kim says, right on dead. Dick LaHaye at 554. Gwen is really going to be disappointed with the 577. Well, it may be that he just pulled some of that power out. So we've got a top fuel semifinal. Dick LaHaye, Gary Beck. LaHaye with a lane choice. The other pair, Garlitz and Pastorini. Once again, Big Daddy with the lane choice. Let's go to Steve with Dick LaHaye. Well, for the man who won it a year ago, Dick LaHaye, you're uh, just another step closer to a repeat win. Well, you know, we came in here with a brand new race car. Never been on a racetrack. And I had that little checkout pass at 560, and then she ran a 49 the next pass. And we run 254s back to back. And we just got to figure out how to make it run a little bit better. And uh, more importantly, you're not hurting a thing. Kim's not having to work too hard. 
Believe me, we had to work hard that last round. We heard a piston, we had to put another clutch in it. And, I mean, we had that we was the last car up there. We had maybe 15 seconds to spare. There well, certain things we can't see. That's it, yeah. We don't know until we get back there. Okay. Good luck to you. Thanks, Steve. And Brock's with the defeated Daryl Gwynn. Well, I'm with a young man who we saw take it all at the Winter Nationals, but I'm afraid in the home state it's not going to be that way, Daryl. Yeah, we wanted to do a little bit better for our hometown fans, but uh, I'm not into hurting my uh, car or hurting my parts, which we've been doing all weekend, and the uh, result can hurt yourself. Um, I saw him out on me, and we've been hurting parts all weekend, and I just lifted uh, right before the finish line. It was pretty unusual for us to hurt as many parts as we did this weekend, but uh, it's a safe weekend, and we'll be back next week. Well, we're sorry, Al, but uh, we're proud of you for using your head in those situations. I wish uh, maybe everybody did. Well, that's true, but uh, we can, we, with our budget, uh, without a major sponsor right now, we can't afford to break a bunch of parts, and maybe we could have gambled if we'd uh, uh, had a bigger budget, but right now we're just running off a shoestring budget, and uh, that's what we got to do for right now. Well, we're sorry it ended for you like this. We know we see you back. Well, yeah, we're just trying to keep up that uh, points lead, the Winston World Championship points lead, and uh, I don't know, regardless, looks like he just might take it away today. Let's hope not. Okay. Well, good luck anyway. Thank see you. you later. Thank you. Darrell Gwynn showing some great maturity. He just can't afford to blow up all those parts, and neither can this team. That is Donny Couch, crew chief for Dan Pastorini, preparing his mount for a battle with Don Garlic in the semifinals. So, what's the mystery to your great-looking hair? Simple. I don't use a regular shampoo. Thank you. What is it? It's head and shoulders. It's everything I want for my hair. And more. Mind if I try it? Catch. It's dandruff protection. Works on your scalp, not your hair. Gentle conditioners go there. This is great hair. And a great way to forget about dandruff. <laughs> Today's head and shoulders. Dandruff care that's good for your hair. This is one of the most unusual schools around. A school for drag racing. And Frank Hawley, who runs it, pushes drivers and cars to the limit. That's why he uses parts that can take a lot of pressure, like Fram oil filters. He knows with a cheap brand there could be problems, like leaking gaskets and maybe even big engine trouble. So Frank thinks it's worth paying a little more for a Fram oil filter. After all, isn't it better to spend a little now instead of a lot later? time here at the Gator Nationals. I'm Brock Gates along with Steve Evans and I gotta ask you Steve, do you think there's a drag racing fan on earth that doesn't recognize that car? Absolutely impossible Brock. That is Kenny Bernstein. He is number one in the world, the world champion, the national lapse time record holder. Won more national events last year than all the competition combined. Well right now he's up against a man who has never won a major NHRA drag race. That is John Forrest, one of the hardest workers, one of the the most devoted competitors in this particular kind of competition and has had victory elude him repeatedly. Just the opposite is true for this man, Kenny Bernstein, now of Newport Beach, California. The reigning world champion and certainly the innovator in the class. John Forrest has been runner-up six times at national events, including the Winter Nationals, where he was defeated by Tim Gross. And ironically, the two met earlier today in round number one. Tim Gross's new car over in the far lane, not the car he won the Winter Nationals with. John Forrest was in the near lane. Now take a good look at Tim Gross's car. Do you see anything unusual about it? Well, I'll tell you more about that in just a bit. But first, let's look at the race that happened earlier today. John Forrest in the near line, Tim Gross. The car's so new, it uh, is unpainted. He's got a brand new truck and trailer coming. Gonna join the big boys with the 18 wheelers. Good to see that young man uh, rewarded with some success after all these years. And John Forrest could use a dose of that success as well. Away they go. And it was John Forrest off the mark. He never looked back. John Forrest just dumped Tim Gross out of competition in round number one. Now, earlier I took a look at Gross's new car. Like everyone else, you may be scratching your head wondering why Tim Gross would bother rerouting the exhaust headers through the body as he has done. Well, this is the first step towards a full ground effects funny car. Before you can add skirting on the sides, you've got to get those headers out of the way. And that's exactly what Tim plans to do. He has ordered the plastic material, the same stuff that was used on Indianapolis cars and is still being used on Super V's. So it will form a seal. It will actually be on the pavement on both sides and the front of the automobile, hopefully creating a ground effect for better elapsed time. I asked 
asked Tim, well, if it's rubbing on the pavement, how long is it going to last? He said, well, it lasted 500 miles at the Indianapolis 500, a quarter mile at a time, a long time. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Steve, he will not have a chance to uh, wear tested anymore here at the Gator Nationals. He's out for the day, and the man who put him out is now going to go against the reigning world champion. There you see John Forts in the far lane, on the near lane, the Fort Tempo of Kenny Bernstein. Now, Bernstein was the low qualifier, the quickest car in the 16-car field, and with good reason, here you see Bernstein driving away from John Forrest. John Forrest goes out in round number two, Kenny Bernstein, a nice 566. Not world-shattering, but nice. 256 miles an hour, Forrest loses at 591. Reasonably typical run for Bernstein, just spring straight right down the middle of the strip. Very consistent, no tire smoke, no apparent damage to the automobile. Very, very typical of the present winning streak that he is on. All right, this is the burnout of the next pair, Billy Meyer. He will be going up against Tom McEwen, one of the real veterans in this sport and one of the best light guys around. So as McEwen and Meyer complete their burnouts and get ready for their round two funny car match, let's go up to the other end with Kenny Bernstein. Well, Kenny Bernstein continues to saw his way through this field. John Forrest, his latest victim at a 566, Kenny. Well, it, uh, it was smooth that time, Steve. Of course, we took a little out of it to get down the racetrack and not shake so hard as the first time. And it worked. It just slowed down a little bit. Forrest is always a tough customer. He'd give you a heck of a fight halfway down. Oh, yeah. He was out on me a little bit, and he always does. He's been beating the points pretty good at the start of this season. So uh, it was nice to get by that one. Besides, he's a little ahead of us in the points, and maybe we can come around him this time. You look at your 566, and you look at Candies and Hughes. Uh, you're far from dominating this. No, Candies and Hughes is right there, and there certainly is no domination this weekend. And uh, unless uh, Dale Armstrong pulls a few more uh, hats out of the ring and gets her going a little quicker. Well, here's a man that expects to pull a few rabbits out of the hat. That's Tom McEwen. He has an onboard computer that was developed by Kenny Bernstein's crew chief, Dale Armstrong. That could help him. Billy Meyer from Waco, Texas, a uh, racetrack promoter and just generally uh, solid professional in this kind of racing. This should be a good event, Steve. And Tom McEwen has a brand new crew chief, Bill Schultz, who has rent so many cars into the winner's circle in drag racing. I think that's going to make a tremendous difference. Billy Meyer looking to improve on last season. Billy Meyer out first. Billy Meyer over the center line. Automatic disqualification. It is Tom McEwen going on to win it at 5.86 seconds. A little off his pace, 249 miles an hour. Meyer, Meyer rather, had a great hole shot, but over the line. And what happened? Well, it's very likely that Billy Meyer experienced what you might call terminal tire shake. The car vibrated so badly that he just lost control and crossed that center line. Of course, according to NHRA rules, that's a buy. You can't do that and stay in competition. From that point on, it was an automatic victory for this man. Well, I don't think I'll have to tell Tom McEwen that Billy Meyer crossed the center line. Good thing I was in front of him. Could you see him? Out my mirror. <laughs> no, I, yeah, he was coming right in my door, so, I, yeah. Clean and dry, another good elapsed time, very steady performance. Yeah, I think Schultz is uh, trying to uh, get a combination down a little different than he had with Pulte's car, where it would run low ET, one run and smoke the tires and X, you know? And I think he's trying to get a consistent situation to get used to me being kind of an old guy. <laughs> trying to make up for that, you know? Well, speaking of Bill Schultz, one of the highest paid mechanics in this business, he doesn't even bother coming down in the car to pick you up. He's in the limousine down there with just the window cracked open with a drink in his hand, and <laughs> if we run good, he comes back to the trailer. I'll tell him you said that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> one of the real funny men in this business, Tom McEwen. And there is a man who wears literally two hats. <laughs> Still in his driving suit, Big Daddy is wrenching his car, getting ready for the next round. We'll be back with more The Gator Nationals following this. pit area is more organized between rounds than that of Kenny Bernstein. Under the leadership of Dale Armstrong, five guys. They all know their job and do it very well. Now, they're getting ready for a semifinal matchup with Tom the Mongoose McEwen. And over in his pit area, things are every bit as orderly as this, except for an engine change going on. 
Now, crew chief Bill Schultz says this motor doesn't seem to want to run quicker than 580. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not fast enough. The camshaft is wrong, compression, whatever. He's putting a brand new bullet out of the trailer into the car. Now, he's not doing it personally. I don't even see him. Maybe he phoned in instructions from the limousine, Brock. <laughs> Maybe it's the limousine's motor. Who's to know? But in any case, it's going to be a fresh run as uh, McEwen gets ready. But right now, we're going to have to go down to yet another former world champion who uh, has had some problems last season. That is the beautiful Candies and Hughes car driven by Cincinnati, Ohio's own Mark Oswald. They just came into this sport a couple of years ago and did beautifully. Last year, not so good. That's right. Well, Mark Oswald had low ET until the last half hour of qualifying when Kenny Bernstein took it away and also the $3,000 with the bonus money that went with it. Part of almost three quarters of a million dollars up here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. Mark Oswald from Cincinnati, Ohio, as we said, won the world championship in funny cars in 84 with this team. Ed McCullough, well, he won so many titles back in the early 70s, I can't even count them all. Took a few years off and then came back with the Larry Minor team. But six weeks ago, the Winter Nationals, this was Ed McCullough in the far lane. Oh, boy. Just about the worst floor explosion we have ever seen. Completely destroyed the body on the car. All that was left were the front fenders. Now he had only six weeks to repair this car. And Brock, after a fire like this, it'd almost be easier to build a new car. There's so much damage. Well, I'm sure that his $100 deductible on the body work definitely was used up because that was about as bad an explosion as we've ever seen in terms of just body damage. Fortunately, though, Ed, who's tough as nails, was all right. He came back, and they, uh, I, I would imagine, though, that's a fresh body, Steve. I don't think they made any repairs on that one. <laughs> I guarantee it. Oswald is ready. McCullough is ready. McCullough in the far lane. It is McCullough away first. Oswald is smoking the tires. Oswald cannot recover. It is Andy Ace McCullough. Color. And, well, I'll tell you, it was lucky Oswald took some tires. That is not a good lap's time. A 667 at a very slow 197 miles an hour. Well, you got to wonder whether the ace backed out of it. It's unlikely, though, to carry rear-view mirrors in these cars, so he may have some problems. All right, the next pair. That is Martin versus Scott Coletta. Of course, Scott is Connie's son. That's right, and in the near lane is John Martin, a heating and air conditioning contractor from Upland, California. He tried the sport a few years with hired drivers and finally decided to have some fun himself. Scott Coletta was going to the drag races before he could even walk. You just knew this kid was going to compete someday. While he ran in a top fuel car for a while, a pair of top fuelers for the Coletta father and son combination, but now it's a funny car with Scott on board and the old man still running the top fuel ranks. <laughs> Looks like maybe one of the crewmen's peeking in there to see if Scott's still on board. I don't know. They got a little bit of problem. Let's go to Steve. Well, Ace, that was simply a case of he had worse luck than you did. He smoked the tires, and your engine didn't sound that good. Uh, I tell you, Steve, we uh, put the rods out of it the first run, and it was a real thrash to get this thing back together, and uh, Mark's been running awful good here, you know, and I mean, I was just lucky, you know. I, I need a little luck. I haven't had it in a long time. Not at Pomona, you certainly didn't. No, sir, we don't need any more of that either. That must have been a, quite a thrash to get this car rebuilt after that horrendous fire. Well, I tell you, Steve, we started uh, Monday morning after Pomona, and we worked right straight through. We had one half of one Sunday off, and we worked right stru th straight through every day, and uh, here we are. You're right. You do deserve a break. <laughs> Thanks. Well, he sure does deserve a break. A great sportsman and one of the bravest guys we've ever seen in this sport. There it is, Scott Coletta. They put the escape hatch back down, and sure enough, they got everything working right. Whatever problems they had seem to be cured. This is Scott Coletta's funny car debut in NHRA competition. He's run some uh, local events around the Michigan area to get a little training in the car. And John Martin, uh, he's a little light on experience himself. It is Martin from California smoking the tires. He's got a fire. Scott Coletta shut off. Coletta gets back on the throttle. Scott Coletta recovers to win. Coletta had given up, but he wins with a 735 at 202 miles an hour. That's one of your weirder races, isn't it? Uh, it looked as if everybody didn't want to win that. <laughs> At first, Martin hesitated, and then Scott, being a polite young man, said, well, gee, if you're going to slow down, I will too. And then he finally uh, said, oh, to heck with it. I'll get back in and win this thing. So Scott Coletta goes on to win, and unfortunately, John Martin will head back to California without a victory. But Scott heads on to the next round. A tenacious victory, young man. It just never hurts to get back on the throttle, does it? That's it. You know, we ain't got it straightened around yet, but they say luck is 90% of it, and so far I've had it. <laughs> you probably heard John Martin kaboom that yeah. one. Yeah. You know, it was shaking the tires, and I almost crossed the center line. That's why I lifted, and then I saw him bang, and I said, take it. 
Will your dad get involved now that he's out? Yeah, he's, he never wasn't involved. <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> well, maybe we'll see the old man riding down the track with Scott in the semifinals. He'll be going up against Ed McCullough. Remember, both these guys had pretty mediocre ETs and some problems on their runs. That'll be interesting. We'll see Tom McEwen go against the King, Ben Kenny Bernstein, and Bernstein has the lane choice. Well, the packed grandstands here at Gainesville Raceway, folks are having a great time and adding to their enjoyment. Two-time funny car champion Frank Hawley is uh, on the public address system telling them what's going on. Back at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals at Gainesville, Florida, I'm Brock Yates along with my pal Steve Evans, who's with Connie Coletta and, believe it or not, a very special guest. Well, I'm with Scott Coletta's father, Connie, and the one they call Mischief here. And uh, you had to be pretty excited watching that last round. Uh, the kid alertly got back on the gas. Yes, I was. I was sure glad he got back after it because it put us into the semis. Well, you have plenty of experience in funny cars. What advice uh, do you have for Scott, or do you even bother him? No, just let him do his thing. He does an excellent job driving the car. He, he's right after it. He knows what the car's feeling like. He can feel it tip over. He does an excellent job. Now, you've sat in the stands and watched plenty of races, too, but when your own kid is in that car, that's got to be a different sensation. It's different. You can, you can get hurt in the car. You can get burned. That's the one thing that really bothers me more than anything in catching the, the car catching on fire, and it can happen. He's tough, though. The kid's tough. So is the old man, believe me. As they get ready to go into the semifinals, that is Scott Coletta's funny car. You'll see him later, but right now, we've got us some pro stock action. Round two, Steve. Indeed we do, in the far lane, the beautiful Trans Am, that is Butch Leal, who last season gave Pontiac the first ever pro stock victory at the Southern Nationals over in Atlanta, GA. Butch is a 41-year-old California pro, now based out of Black Lick, Ohio. His competition, well, he is also driving a Trans Am, a beautiful black and silver car. That's a husky boy named Dempsey Hardy from Vero Beach, Florida. This could be an interesting one. As we know, Butch Leal, a master of the light, but Dempsey Hardy's been running very well with that car lately, and it could be a lot closer than you might think. Leal on paper could be the favorite, but Dempsey Hardy, I'm sure, has upset on his mind. Oh, I totally agree. It's Leal who is usually in that upset role. Here, you would have to count him as a favorite, but uh, give a good chance to Dempsey Hardy. They move in very carefully, as the pro stocks do. The RPMs come up to almost 8,000, and then they'll just sidestep that clutch when they see the yellow light. Dempsey Hardy carrying the front wheels beautifully. Look at Hardy. He is in this thing. Dempsey Hardy, Butch Leal. Oh, did he give Leal a scare. Dempsey Hardy left the starting line first by three hundredths of a second. Ran a 7.65 to Leal. Much quicker in winning 7.56. Top speed a little bit uh, closer, though, Steve. 182 miles an hour for Dempsey, 183 for Butch. It turned out, though, that it was right about mid-track that Leal took command of the race and went on to win. But as you said, Dempsey Hardy gave him virtually everything he expected and then a little bit more, almost a half a car length win. Our next pair of post dogs are fired and ready during their semi-stationary burnouts. This is the Firebird of Don Campanella. He will be up against the Camaro of Jerry Ekman. Interesting story on Don Campanella. He's from Wayne, New Jersey, and he struggled so much in qualifying that he was gonna load the car and go home. And his crewman said, Don, we came all this way, let's try another run, they qualified third. Jerry Ekman from Ventura, California, has that pretty Camaro. Has never won an NHRA national event, but boy, he's tough in the first, second, sometimes even the third round. Ekman is in the far lane, the near lane, Campanello. Hard to pick a favorite in this one. These guys are both good runners, but as you say, not quite yet ready to challenge the uh, Glidden's and the Warren Johnson's, but it could be a very, very interesting race right now. Well, Campanella qualified so much better than Ekman did that I would ride. Oh, in fact, Ekman has red-lighted. I think that was a case where he felt he needed an edge off the line. He gambled and lost. So pay no attention to who crossed the finish line first. Don Campanella wins it here in the near lane at 763, 180 per. Well, I suppose, Steve, you get percentage-wise more red lights in pro stock than any other category because these guys are so competitive, the cars are so evenly matched that you have to squeeze that light, you have to have that microsecond reaction time or else you're simply not going to win. You not only have to have big power and great handling, but boy, the reaction time is just so critical. And in that case, it was a 
Ekman has just squeezed it too close. Okay, our next pair of pro stocks are fired and ready. 2,350 pounds, 500 cubic inches maximum, pump gasoline, two four barrel carburetors. That's pretty much the rules. In the far lane is Gordy Rivera from Yuma, Arizona. In the near lane is Gene Bashing. Both of these guys have traveled a lot of miles to be here at the Gator Nationals. Fashing has an Oldsmobile Calais, and he is all the way from Winstead, Minnesota. Just a dedicated drag racer still looking for that first big one. Gordon Rivera, boy, he's come so close. He's made the final rounds. He's enjoyed some beautiful hole shots. I know, Brock, you've enjoyed interviewing the guys. Reminds you a little bit of Lee Trevino. Really an amusing guy. Good, fun guy. Here's an interesting contrast between the kind of new and old cars. Fashing is in one of those narrow, tiny little... 86 Oldsmobile Sierras, tiny little frontal area. Gordy is in one of the larger, older, really more conventional Camaros. You'll notice if you get a headshot on these two cars that Gordy's car is considerably wider and pushes a lot more air. Let's see if it makes any difference. They are off the mark right together at half track. It's still a pretty good race, but it looks like gas in the far lane. Gordy Rivera pulls it off. No parachute, but this is a good long racetrack. He'll gather it up. 761 at 175 miles an hour for Gordy. So it was just a question of big power, and Gordy pulled it off. Uh, he did give away a little bit, as I said, in frontal areas, perhaps streamlining, but it didn't make any difference. He goes on, and there is the man who has won more pro stock races and more pro stock titles than anybody else, Bob Glidden. Look at the back of Glidden's car, Brock. Uh, the wheelie bars there that are kind of uh, coated with some kind of white substance. Well, earlier, I found out all about that. The Pro Stock Automobile is certainly the most sophisticated in drag racing. But conversely, one of their most important chassis tuning tools is a bottle of white shoe polish. You nurses will recognize this. They take the shoe polish and coat the wheelie bars. Now, what this tells them, for example, let's say the car leaves the starting line, the left wheelie bar barely touches the ground, the right one leaves a long white track then they know that the car is loaded too heavily on the right side. An adjustment needs to be made. Ideally, these wheels should just barely graze the racetrack for three or four feet and just leave a minor little white stripe. If it does that, the chassis set up right. That's the kind of thinking that brings championships, and Ned has done it six times for this man, Bob Glidden, from Whiteland, Indiana. Bruce Allen, he's in the famed rare Morrison Camaro, one of the strongest motors under that hood that you'll find anywhere. Absolutely. Now, Glidden posted a personal best of 749 here in qualifying at the Gators. So count him a, a slight favorite, but anytime it's Ford versus Chevrolet, don't you know it gets the fans' attention? That battle goes back to the early 60s. It is Glidden away first. Glidden with a 4 one hundreds hole shot. But wait a minute. Look at the power in the Chevrolet. Pulling even in the head is Bruce Allen. 769 at 178 miles an hour. He powered by Bob Glidden, Brock. A classic drag racing confrontation, about as good as they ever get in Pro Stock. Look at that launch of Bob Glidden's, a beautiful hole shot. The Ford looks as if it's on its way to victory right there, but it was the car, the Camaro of Bruce Allen from Arlington, Texas, that pulls it out just before they get into the eyes. There it is, about a half a car length. 178 miles an hour for the winner. Glidden's crew was doing a victory dance on the starting line when they saw that whole shot, but it was not to be. Here's how the semifinals will set up in pro stock. Bruce Allen for Chevrolet. Butch Leal for Pontiac. Leal will have the lane choice. That should be a beauty. It'll be Don Cabanello. Really the surprise so far in this race up against Gordy Rivera. Those are the pro stock semifinals, and we'll be back with more from the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. is that when you're not watching them run, you can go back in the pit area and watch them wrench the cars. And that's what's going on right now in Ed McCullough's pit area as they get ready for the semifinal round of the funny cars. Boy, these guys have got some work ahead of them, Steve, because remember, he had some problems on his last pass. All right, it is time for the semifinal round of Top Fuel Dragster Racing here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals, and that is Dan Pastorini. He is up against Big Daddy Don Garland. One of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play in the NFL, 14 years in all, up against unquestionably the greatest drag racer of all time, who is very concerned with those front wheels and their skinny little fan belt style tires. In fact, while we were away, Garlic was on the public address system and told the fans that he was sorry he wouldn't be able to run 270, that he was going to try to run only as fast as he had to to win. 
Now for Dan Pastorini, you'll recall, he defeated Shirley Muldowney in round one with a hole shot. I talked to him earlier about his success today. To beat Shirley Muldowney and Don Garlitz in one afternoon, I don't know of a top field driver who hasn't had that dream. You've got a shot at making it reality here. It is a dream come true, really, Steve. I'm, I'm really excited about it. We've, uh, we've been working real hard for the last year. I gotta give credit where credit's due. This car wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for Donnie Couch. He's done a tremendous job getting the car ready. And as you know, we're not a high dollar operation, but you know, we get the thing, we get the job done sometimes. You ran a 548 in qualifying. If you can go back to that, you will be very competitive against Garlic. I think we're capable of doing that. This morning we had a little tire shake against Shirley, and then uh, we went out and remedied that the second round. We just did a little squirt for about 200 feet, and the car left real good, so I shut it off, fortunately, because we had the uh, the blower pulley uh, tighten up on us, so we... Will uh, Donnie risk hurting the motor to beat Garlitz? We're going we're gonna to try to win, let's put it that way. We're going to try to win like if we had a million-dollar sponsorship behind us. This is what we came here for. That is no longer Dan Pastorini, ex-quarterback. That is Dan Pastorini, drag racer. And you heard him say he's had that dream of beating Shirley, Big Daddy. Well, he's, he's got one of them down, Brock, and now it's time to meet the master. Don Garland's got to be concerned about those front wheels, but it is Garland off the mark first. Don Garland with the hold up, but look at Pastorini. Pastorini was so close. Hit back. The scoreboard says it all. 272 miles an hour. The fastest speed in history. The crowd has gone nuts. It is bedlam. And give a little credit to that to Pastorini, who pushed Garland through the 270 mile an hour barrier. He sure did. He gave Garland a whole lot, all the way down to quarter mile. Garland's just roared through the lights, though, at the record chattering pace. Remember, this was a racetrack that brought us 260 miles an hour. And now we see 272, the fastest ever run by an internal combustion engine dragster. Rocket cars are run faster, but it's still a moment to remember. But there's a penalty. Garlitz has shed yet another front tire. You can hear him in the background. The crew says it. You punched a hole in the air. You drive right through it. 272. Oh, my God. Too fast for the record. <laughs> Too fast for those bands on those rear wheels. Yeah, we got to have some real tires up on the front of this thing. You know, I heard you say to your crew, I'm not going to try the 270. That's over with for this race. There it was. Well, it's just, it's just running good, you know. If, you know, you can't hardly help yourself. You basically tune, and I didn't really, we didn't, we were taking nitro out of it. It's just that it's so slick. The concept obviously works. Yes, it's, it's the design of the future. There's no question about it. We'll have the tire thing fixed. We've already got tires. We've got some little airplane tires. That's going to do the job just nice. Oh, by the way, you went, ran low ET as well, a quicker 540. Great, great. Okay. <laughs> Big Daddy, the fastest man in the world of drag racing. But right now, all he's thinking about is the next round. Garlic just uh, kind of eats records and digests them and goes on to something else. All right, semifinal round. Uh, yet again, this pairing of these two veterans, Gary Beck and Dick LaHaye, the defending champion here at the Muttercraft Gator Nationals. And, of course, Gary Beck, as I said earlier, won the World Finals just this past October. So both of these would be worthy opponents for Big Daddy Don Garlitz, and I'm sure both of them want a shot at him. Now, Gary Beck has been running quicker and quicker with each round. Dick LaHaye, as we heard him say earlier, that was a brand new car when he came in here, so we really don't know what its potential is. Absolutely right. And LaHaye worked so hard with his daughter, Kim, to get this thing ready. They haven't even put a paint job on it yet, Steve. All right, they are staged and ready. Gary Beck in the far lane, near lane, Dick LaHaye. It is LaHaye away first. Beck smokes the tires, but he won't give up. Beck charges, not enough. Dick LaHaye wins it. Kim loves it. LaHaye at 547. He will be a worthy challenger to Garland. Beck at a 551. An incredible elapsed time, considering how hard he smoked the tires. Big Daddy heads back to the pits. He now knows that he will face Dick LaHaye in the top fuel finals. So there you have it, as Big Daddy heads back to the pits for yet another tire change after that 272 mile an hour pass. That's Ed McCullough's crew. They're still thrashing to get ready for his race against Scott Coletta. That's his competition. Now let's go to Dick LaHaye, who has the dubious distinction of racing Garlands. Well, this sets up as one heck of a Gator Nationals final. The defending champion, Dick LaHaye, against Don Garlands. A 547. You can race with him. Yeah, well, we felt we could as long as we're learning about this new car, and every time we make a change, it responds, and I'm really liking this thing. 
And from the looks of the motor, maybe there's more in it. Oh, yeah, I think so. We found something that last run that we, we thought, gosh, how come we didn't catch this before? <laughs> you were strapped in the car. You could see the scoreboard. Garlic's run 272. Yeah, I know. I mean, he's got it zipping down there in the lights, don't he? And it's just, it's unreal. I don't know how fast this thing will run because I haven't run it through the lights yet, but we're going to try. We're about to find out, huh? That's it. <laughs> One of the really good guys in this business, Dick LaHaye, as he gets ready to face off against Big Daddy Don Garlitz in the Top Fuel Final. Boy, they love their Big Daddy here at the Motocraft Gator Nationals, right in the heart of Florida, the home state for the man who just ran 272 miles an hour, and one of the fans brought Big Daddy this. Well, what the heck, give him a break. He only exceeded the speed limit by two miles an hour. But up front, uh, some problems again with those front wheels, and uh, that uh, carbon fiber nose piece has also uh, been abused once again, but you know it'll get it fixed. Here we go, into pro stock. Well, you recognize that Camaro, Steve. That is the rare Morrison car driven by Bruce Allen. And he is up against the man, Butch Leal, and his Firebird. This could be a really interesting matchup. These guys, E.T., just about the same in their last round. You know, Butch Leal was very conservative off the starting line. Actually let uh, his previous opponent away first and reeled him in. He can't do that with Bruce Allen. Allen has equal horsepower at least. Well, he's got a notch on his gun belt that very few have gotten recently. He just knocked off Bob Glidden. All right, they're moving into stage. You can hear those RPMs come up. They strain the motors to the limit. It is Butch Leal away first. Leal has nailed Bruce Allen on the lines, but by only two hundredths of a second. Is that going to be enough? Oh, boy. Yes, it is. Butch Leal goes into the final round at 7.54 to Allen's quicker, 7.52. Well, it was right at the lights that he wanted. It was a beautiful hole shot by Butch Leal, and it paid off for him. As we go to Don Campanello and Gordy Rivera, yet another pair of guys that really are very much due for major victories here. Well, especially Gordy Rivera. He has come so close. Now, Campanella, he's been to the semis a lot of times. Uh, he has an opportunity here to go into, I believe, it would be his first ever final. And let's remember how well he qualified uh, after struggling for a couple of days. So, Campanella, he's hungry, no question. Well, we've got a couple of the big hitters in this uh, business outright. Now, Warren Johnson not in it, and of course, Bob Gooden out of the deal. So, it may be a wide open proposition for some of these not what you'd call underdogs, but guys that don't win quite as much in pro stock. That's absolutely right. Gordon Rivera, speed shop operator in Yuma, Arizona. And they leave the line very close together. A slight advantage to Campanella. And Campanella's going to parlay that into a victory at 7.69, 177 miles an hour. Don't you know he's glad he didn't go home. Gordy Rivera at a 7.74. And there's the final pairings from New Jersey. Don Campanella from Ohio. Butch Leal. It's an all-General Motors affair. Absolutely. Well, here he comes again. Mr. Consistency, Kenny Bernstein. I can name you a bunch of airlines that don't run as close to a schedule as this guy. He is so clean and quick in this racetrack, in this race car. But the man he goes against is Tom the Mongoose McEwen. They put a fresh motor in here. Remember, he get it that his crew chief, Bill Schultz, rides around in a limousine. But you got to believe Bill got out of the car to get this ready for this race. All right, now let's go to Steve with Butch Leo. Well, for years, we've been saying how quick Butch Leal is off the starting line. It paid off again. You had two hundreds in the bank, and you needed it. He ran two hundreds quicker. Oh, yeah, it was the greatest race. Uh, Bruce is always there every time. And I told him last year, I said, you beat me every time I race you. My year this year. And uh, he's just such a nice guy and a great driver, as you know. And uh, I knew they'd be ready at this time. They've been having trouble, and uh, they got it fixed. And uh, he was right beside me. Matter of fact, I didn't know who won. You looked for me, didn't you? Yeah, I was looking for you, Steve, and uh, I just said, whoa, boy, this one's close. I didn't know. I couldn't turn around, as you know, we're so tight in the car to look to see the wind like, but that was a great race. Let's hope we talk one more time. Yeah, one more time. Thank you. Good job by Butch Leal, who is very much overdue as Bruce Allen comes over to shake hands and say, congratulations, job well done. All right, there goes the mongoose backing in. He is ready to go, and boy, he's got his work cut out for him, Steve. And I'll tell you, what a gutsy play by the McEwen crew and Bill Schultz to take out an engine that was just fine and put in a brand new bullet. But you, you might as well try something when you race Kenny Bernstein. As you as have emphasized, Rocky is consistently quick, not just occasionally, but all the time. This racetrack has been very good to Bernstein. He won the event here a year ago. He was the first to run 260 miles an hour. That happened right here. 
Burns. So Tom McEwen said, we got to try something. Bernstein in the near lane, McEwen in the far lane as they stage here at Gainesville. All right, this could be a good one. Bernstein away. McEwen head to head. This is going to be a tight one. Who won it? Tom the Mongoose McEwen has upset Kenny Bernstein. He out drove him up the starting line, ran 200 slower, and drilled the reigning world champion. The engine change paid off. Boy, did it just do that. Look at this. McEwen off the line by just a wink, a little bit better reaction time, but it appears right here that Bernstein is running him down as they get into the lights. Now, you look at this. You'd swear that it's Kenny Bernstein that won it. But the lights don't lie. And now, let's talk to the man who pulled it out. I'll tell you, the driving talents of Tom McEwen and the wrenching ability of Bill Schultz may be tough to beat this season. You had a 300s hole shot, and it's a good thing. He ran 200s quicker. You ran 567 and beat him. No time for jokes, Evans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you the God's truth. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we're due, I think. And it was Schultz's decision to change the engines, and it paid off. The whole thing is this a decision, everything. All I try to do is leave somewhere in the majority of a minute on the light down there, no matter what Frank Hawley may say. Uh, we beat Frank, you know, we run him out of drag racing, you know. He gets it up there all he wants, but, you know, he wasn't the flash, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we're happy to be here, and I'm happy with the whole crew and the whole everything, and let's just hope our luck hangs on. Oh, boy, just one more, huh, Goose? Coors is liking this. This, this course is for Bernstein. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Frank Hawley was ragging Goose a little bit over the PA system about maybe he was getting a little bit old for this business. But I'll tell you what. He was young enough to knock off Kenny Bernstein. Kenny, here at Gainesville, you and I usually talk about to one hour later than this. But McEwen just stepped up there. He did. He sure did. He ran good. He left a little ahead of me. And he ran better than he's ever run in a long time. Hats off to him. He did a heck of a job. He has one of your computers on board. He said he thought maybe Bernstein had put a 580 chip in it. He couldn't go any quicker, so he changed engines. I'd like to have it back. Maybe I'd put a 60 chip in it right now, but that's it. No, he did a good job. That's what it's all about. And Dale Armstrong, my crew, did a super yeah. job, too. So, you know, it's just the way it goes. You one. leave with a track record as well, 559. You know, we'll just hang in there and keep going. See you on down the road. Got it. Good job by the champion, but not quite good enough. All right, here's the next pair. I don't know, Steve, Scott Coletta, Ed McCullough, who's to know? What do you think about this? Well, which is the luckiest is uh, one point. Both of these guys are very fortunate to be here. Scott Coletta was beaten, and the other guy blew up. McCullough had a, a very slow elapsed time the previous round, but was fortunate enough to have the other driver go up in smoke. So uh, anything could happen here. Uh, let's hope they both got their problem solved. Coletta is just really a, a lack of funny car experience. Uh, a year from now, you're not going to be looking at the same operation, I don't think. Right. This is a brand new car and basically a brand new driver in the funny cars. As we know, he's run the top fuel cars and been around his father for years and years and years watching how it's done. Ed McCullough, on the other hand, has been in this sport probably almost as long as any of the top professionals. He's seen it all. All right, we've got to start. And Coletta in trouble. Sideways, looks like he went up in smoke. And Ed McCullough goes on to yet again a very slow ET, Steve, 6.22. Well, these are lap times are four tenths off a qualifying, but it doesn't matter. It'll be Ed the Ace McCullough against Tom the Mongoose McEwen in the final round. I don't have to tell you, McEwen will have lane choice. And there's one busy girl, Kim and Dick LaHaye, the only two people preparing that car. No fancy air wrenches. They do things the old-fashioned way. They earn it. Well, that man could run for governor of Florida and probably win in a landslide if the election was held tomorrow. Don Garland straps the blower manifold on the engine, getting ready for the top fuel final here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals in Gainesville, Florida. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates, and only six cars remain. Two pro stocks, two funny cars, two top fuel dragsters, and this is the pro stock final. Don Campanella and his firebird to the far lane, hitting up the tires. Brock, I checked in the stats, and Campanella has been in one other final round back in 1984 at the Southern Nationals. And this is an all Pontiac Pro Stock Final. First time that's ever happened. Right. So they're guaranteed of yet another win. They've only had one in the Pro Stock ranks, but they're going to get another one no matter who wins. As we watch Butch Leal, known to be the master of the like, uh, going back, uh, trying to take another shot. Campanella, I don't know. It's going to be a really interesting round. Race. These guys have, uh, as we said earlier, just about been equal all day long. And uh, the matchup, I'd say, just about.
about even. Well, I don't know, Brock, but looking at Leo's the last times, the last few rounds, they have been considerably quicker. So I have a feeling maybe Campanella, his motor may be going away. He's been going slower and slower every round, and Leo has been going at least as quick as the round before. So I would give a, a pretty good advantage to Leo, really. Well, it's a big deal to change motors in these uh, machines. Not like the top fuel in a funny car, you don't just snap one in. So uh, probably Campanella's had got to go with what he's got. Absolutely, he had nothing left. He broke one motor in for the Moving in is Butch Leal and Don Campanella. The pros got final. Butch Leal, red lights. Unbelievable. Butch Leal, red lights. And as you can see, he had plenty of performance to have beaten Campanella. But he gave away the win. Don Campanella wins his first ever NHRA championship, shutting off to an 813 at 132 miles an hour. I think Leal was just so keyed up that he, he doesn't know how to back off. Well, he didn't back off enough because he squeezed that light just a wink too much. The old red light came on and it was a bye-bye. Campanello wins it. Well, I don't think Don Campanello had the foggiest idea that Butch Little had red lighted when he rolled up here, no, Don. No, he's a pretty good driver. Congratulations. For a guy who was going to go home yesterday, are you glad you stayed? <laughs> Got me on a spot now. <laughs> you had a lot of motor trouble, but you came through. Oh, uh, yeah. Changed three engines. We had a lot of problems all through the week. You know, we only made one qualifying run. But uh, when luck is with you, it's just, it's just there. Well, congratulations. Thanks. The biggest day in your drag racing career. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Don Campanella, the upset winner of Pro Stock. And a man who will go back to New Jersey with about $17,000 in his jeans as Butch Leo comes over to offer his congratulations. Well, Butch Leal, you rolled in here, and I don't think you knew you had red-lighted. No, I didn't. Uh, I thought I won the race, and that's pretty disappointing, Steve, at this time. I... The way you lean on that tree, though. Well, it wasn't that. I I thought I got in well. See, I get in tight, and I was ready. As you know, as you get further along elimination, you get uh, quicker and quicker, and uh, I seem to, anyway. And uh, I didn't think I leaned on it that hard. I figured that I had a little bit of advantage, maybe, over him. I don't know what I ran compared to him, but... Uh, when I, better. when I visited you this winter in freezing cold, black like Ohio, you told me you were dedicating yourself this season to the World Championship, and you got a lot of points here. Yeah, we did, and uh, if we're not leading, we're very close to right now leading the championship, and uh, I just feel bad for, uh, you know, all the guys that spent all the time working real hard at the shop, and, uh, you know, of course for Nationwide and uh, Castro, GTX, but in... Uh, Gil's going to call me tonight and say what happened. I said we should have won a race, maybe. Gil Kirk has raced a lot of years. He'll understand. I hope so. Thank you. Tough break for Butch Leo, but back at the starting line, a major break for Ed McCullough because this man, Tom the Mongoose McEwen, will not run. That means McCullough will make a bye run. He can coast it down the track to win the Funny Car Championship. And McEwen had it all going for him. Brought McCullough struggled all day long, and the goose painfully looks at McCullough shut the car off. McCullough didn't have enough in the motor to even make it a quarter of a mile. McEwen, unfortunately, had to give it to him. Hard to say what happened to the Goose's car. I thought I heard a little bit of a bang, maybe a supercharger backfire. But this man, Ed the Ace McCullough, he coasts off the end of Gainesville Raceway with the funny car title in his pocket and Lady Luck in his lap. But I'll tell you, a guy who doesn't need any luck, he has just thoroughly thumped the competition so far. That, of course, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, an all-time world record of 272 miles an hour. But Dick LaHaye, he could be tough. When Joe Amato's racing, he's got one thing on his mind, winning. But Tim Richards, his chief mechanic, has a lot of things to worry about. That's why he puts in spark plugs he and you can always count on, Autolite. They're made by the only American company that puts a tough copper glass seal here, so the insulators won't blow out of the engine like some plugs. Now where does this leave Joe Amato? In first place, Autolite. Only two cars remain in the Motocraft NHRA Gator Nationals. This man, Dick LaHaye, with his daughter, Kim, firing up that massive power plant, will go up against Don Garlitz. Garlitz will say it again, 272 miles an hour. You get the feeling, Brock, that with that configuration on this brand new car, that motor is running much easier. He is indeed punching a hole in the air and getting through it for a close up. It could very well be. You can see the major contrast in the cars. Dick LaHaye, a very conventional machine, beautifully turned out, and it's run very, very well. But Garlitz, 
seems to have the handle. He came in here with that car with that beautiful streamlining, has had problems with the front tires just keeping him on. But as he said, he'll get that sorted out. It's just a matter of time. Okay, now as the guys complete their burnouts, let's go to the other end with a funny car, Victor. Well, ladies, congratulations on winning the Gator Nationals. We could still make a flight to Vegas. You want to do that tonight? You're hot. I tell you, Steve, as long as I've been without any luck at all, I think I got all two years of it right here today. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, I don't know what was wrong with the pins car. It kind of popped, and that was that. The guy said it sounded like possibly it hydraulic it up there at the starting line, you know, and, uh, you know, I... I don't know what to say. I mean, I was glad to see McEwen go, you know, get this far. Sure. He ran real good. He welded Bernstein, you know. And, <laughs> uh, you know, that was a big plus for him. Uh, we, we joked about it a little bit. Who's the luckiest today? Well, I'm the luckiest today. Hard to believe six weeks ago you were riding a volcano. Well, this makes it worth it. I mean, uh, I would much rather be out here running low ET, but... Uh, you know, our Miller American, you know, team here, we work real hard at what we do, and uh, our Oldsmobile, when we get her straightened out, look out, boys. I agree with that. Congratulations, Ed the East McCullough, Gator Nationals, funny car champion. Thank you. Our congratulations as well, Ed. All right, back to the starting line, and Steve, it looks like Big Daddy's got another set of rubber on there. He sure does, and he hopes it's the last time he ever has to change him. You heard him say earlier he's got him some kind of airplane tire. <laughs> Lord knows what he'll come up with. But Dick LaHaye and Don Garlitz both debuted brand new cars at this event. Had never made a lap down a drag strip. Big Daddy, of course, with a very distinctive uh, canopy over him. Dick LaHaye, he'll probably have one of those real quick. And I tell you, what Garlitz has done here is very easily imitated if you can find the right kind right. of wheels and tires. I think he's got the stereo on in there. Probably got the air turned up. Things are nice and comfortable. Well, no matter what, Dick LaHaye will win the Roadster class while Big Daddy will take home the coupe title. He can guarantee you that. I'll tell you, if LaHaye can get a good start here, this is not over yet. And LaHaye does get a good start. But he smokes the tires just a little bit, and that's going to be enough. And LaHaye supercharger. LaHaye was within a half a car length of Garlitz as Garlitz slows down a full tenth to a 550. Had that blower not have come off, Dick LaHaye might well have robbed Big Daddy of the Gator Nationals title. LaHaye's car launches beautifully, wheels in the air. He's ahead of Garlitz. He sure is. Garlitz strings straight. LaHaye a little bobble at about quarter track, but he gets it back. And then the disastrous blower explosion right in the lights, and that cost him victory. But I'll tell you what, no shame on the part of Dick LaHaye. There you see it. That was the end of it all as Big Daddy goes on to victory here at the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. An outstanding run by both men. Well, Don, as many years as you've been racing, few days could possibly be more satisfying than today was. The hometown crowd, everything went right, the record, the, the whole deal. Yeah, what did we turn? Not quite enough to back up the record, but believe me, everyone acknowledges you were the first to go 270. Really? It's uh, been quite a day. And I noticed there's uh, some scars on the canopy there. It's nice to have that there. A piece of that belt came back with the fiberglass and hit it pretty hard. I have a feeling that's the last time we'll see the belts on the yeah. front end of this car. You can bet on that. <laughs> Dick LaHaye was a tough customer. He exploded a blower there. He might have even been tougher. Yeah. Yeah, he was right there almost all the way. And the theory works. The front end works. Yeah, the, the design is correct. We just got to get the right components up there. How long do you think it'll take before someone imitates it? Well, I imagine a few weeks. <laughs> Don Garlitz, the Gator Nationals champion for the fourth time. And our congratulations to Big Daddy and to Funny Car champion Ed McCullough and Pro Stock champ Don Campanella. For Steve Evans, I'm Brock Gates. Thanks for joining us. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Pallage. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashion. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. The American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond V Sports.